If you could start by just talking a bit about what happened to you in, in 1990 for those who might not be familiar with your story. Well, maybe just to give a lightning overview, um, I'm originally from New Zealand. Um, I, uh, age of 17, went to Australia and joined the Anglican Religious Order, the Society of the Sacred Mission. They transferred me to South Africa in 1973. Um, where I was already a priest, but I became a university student as well as a university chaplain. Um, after the uh, killing of school children in South Africa in 1976, I was at that time national chaplain for Anglican or Episcopal students, um, and speaking out against what happened to children, uh, the killings, the tortures, the maiming, the, all of those horrific things. I was then expelled from South Africa. I went to live in Lesotho, which is a small country completely surrounded by South Africa. And there I joined the African National Congress of South Africa, the, the liberation movement um, of Nelson Mandela. Um, and uh, later I, I, I went to live in Zimbabwe. And in April of 1990, three months after Nelson Mandela was released from prison, I received in the post two religious magazines, uh, which I opened and they exploded. Uh, and that was how I lost both my hands and I, my eardrums were shattered and many other injuries. But I always say that when the bomb went off, I had a sense that God was with me, that, that if you like, to me, the great promise of scripture had been kept, not the promise we won't suffer, which God doesn't promise, but lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So uh, that was on April the 28th, uh, 1990, that that bomb uh, happened. But people all across the world accompanied me on my journey of healing through their prayer, their love and their support. So in my work today with the Institute for Healing of Memories, I'm seeking to accompany others on their journey of healing to create what we call safe and sacred spaces where people can deal with what's happened to them and also travel their journeys of healing. You wouldn't be able to do this work that you're speaking about um, today if you had not forgiven your enemies. Uh, could you talk a bit about your own journey to healing and forgiveness and also if you could meet your perpetrators, what would you say to them? Well, I, I want to make the distinction between healing of memories and forgiveness. I often say when I, I tell my story that I'm not full of hatred, I'm not bitter, and I don't want revenge. Um, but in reality, I haven't forgiven anybody because in my case, there's nobody yet to forgive. I don't know who made the bomb, I don't know who sent it, I don't know who wrote my name on an envelope. But if the people who did it are imprisoned by what they did, I have a key and I'm willing to turn it. Um, so I don't know what it would be like to actually meet the people responsible, but I, I wonder and, uh, and I speculate on that. So for example, maybe when I get back to South Africa, um, there'll be a knock on the door. Somebody's there and they say, I'm the one who sent you that little bomb. Will you forgive me? Uh, so how do I respond? Yes, no, not yet. I might say, excuse me, sir, do you still make letter bombs? He says, no, 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 no. Actually, I work at the local hospital around the corner from you. Will you forgive me? Yes, sir, I forgive you. And I would prefer that you spend the next 50 years working in that hospital rather than be locked up in prison. Because I believe a thousand times more in the justice of restoration than the justice of punishment. So often when we say justice, we mean punishment if not revenge, but of course there's another kind of justice, the justice of restoring relationships. But then perhaps I drink tea with my new friend and say, well, sir, I've forgiven you, but I still have no hands. I still only have one eye. My eardrums are still damaged. I'll always need someone to assist me for the rest of my life. Of course, you will help pay for that person not as a condition of forgiveness, but as part of reparation and restitution in the ways that are possible. So I think there are many people who forgiveness is not yet on the table because they don't know who did it. Um, 
but for whom there's a need to deal with what they have inside themselves, to travel on these journeys towards healing. And then one day, perhaps, it may be possible to, to, to take that giant step towards forgiveness. I think, you know, in, in, in the Christian community especially, we often speak of forgiveness. In such a way, we create the impression it's something glib and cheap and easy. In my experience, for most human beings, it's costly, it's painful, it's difficult. And yet, when it happens, there's mutual liberation. It's very interesting that the, the word in the Greek of the New Testament for forgiveness, aphiemi, is the same word as untying a knot. So when there's unforgiveness, we are each other's prisoner. When there's forgiveness, we, we are freed. But sometimes I think even as Christians, we're too quick to tell hurting people, and you should forgive. When often hurting people, what they're asking for is not a sermon, they're asking for a loving embrace. They're asking us to hear and acknowledge their pain. And then perhaps one day they will choose to travel the journey to forgiveness. What do you think about the, um, the situation in South Africa today? Was the Truth and Reconciliation Commission successful? Is there still more work to be done for healing and reconciliation? You know, um, South Africa's was not the first Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It was about the 13th, and, 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 but the most famous. And we ourselves learned from places like Argentina and Chile. Uh, so the question was, how do we provide a transition from an old dictatorial order to a democratic state? How do we, how do we deal with the past? People often say that um, we wanted to turn the page of history, but we realized we had to read it before it could be turned. And we read it to a greater degree of any country in history in terms of dealing with its past. But the, 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 the legislation on which the commission was set up was called the Promotion of Truth, Unity and Reconciliation. But I think sometimes our own kind of westernness made us think that you could have a commission for two, three, four, five years and then we've dealt with the past, thank you very much, we can move on to the future. But the war and oppression and discrimination in South Africa, the roots of apartheid, went back 300 years. So in three years, have we dealt with the past? Of course not. In 20 years, this, this, uh, it, it, it's, it's the 20th anniversary of our democratic state. And I think we're beginning to realize and see that there are many signs that whilst the commission helped us take some giant steps, we're still a traumatized nation, and that trauma manifests particularly in the sexual, family, uh, personal violence that still racks our society. And so we begin to see that the journey of healing is in fact an intergenerational journey. And the issue for our generation is can we face our woundedness? And I say in the South African context, we need a national, a new national conversation in which we are able to speak about our pain. We can able to speak about not just the, the economic and the political uh, oppression, but to speak about how our souls, the soul of a nation, was damaged by the journey that we've traveled. So the issue of national healing still remains uh, incredibly important, despite the wonderful steps that we did take on that journey, uh, which is, of course is why an organization like ours, an Institute for Healing of Memories, still has great relevance uh, uh, in South Africa, as equally it does in the United States uh, as well, where I think here in the US, the soul of this country has been damaged by unending war. How does um, being a foreigner in South Africa and also white um, help or hinder your work? Well, uh, you know, today I, I am a South African citizen. I have dual nationality, South African and uh, New Zealand. Uh, so in that sense, um, uh, and at the age I am now, having been born in 1949, having been in South Africa since 1973, the greatest proportion of my life has already been spent 
uh, in the countries of Southern Africa and in these 20 years of democracy. So that itself is not an issue. I, I think that um, what I've discovered is that pain is transcendent. Uh, pain connects people. So much of my work is in the black community, but w what the passport of the community is that I've suffered. I always remember a woman coming to me, an, an, an African woman, and saying, um, beginning to tell her story, and I was at that time at a trauma center for victims of violence and torture. So I said, I will refer you to one of our psychologists, one of our psychiatrists, we can assist you. She said, no. So why do you say no? She said, well, firstly, I've already speak, spoken to them, but she said, for me, so I said, why do you want to talk to me? And she said, because you know suffering, because you know pain. And that was more important than the color of my skin. So ironically, the very what I've lost, uh, which is dramatic and visible, becomes a passport to people's brokenness, which often is not visible to the naked eye, but is no less real. Uh, and that's a passport for me to do this work uh, all over the world. Um, because and I, I, I think that uh, brokenness and um, is in fact the norm of the human family, not completeness and perfection. That's not the experience that, that we have. And those of us with traumatic physical disability are a reminder to the rest of the human family of what is true for all of us. How is the ongoing AIDS epidemic affecting South Africa and the African continent today and how is your organization responding? Um, today, uh, UNAIDS would say that uh, South Africa's program, Fighting AIDS, is among the best in the world in terms of the rollout of antiretrovirals. Um, but uh, we still have millions of people um, infected, affected by the disease. Um, and, 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 and we still have a very long way to travel in fighting the pandemic. And we ourselves as an institute asked ourselves the question, this pandemic affects the nation, what's our, what's our response? And, and, and we realized that our response was not going to be about um, antiretrovirals, about safe sex, it had, it had to be about what we know about, which is the stories. So what we did was create opportunities for people infected, affected, uh, to deal with what they had inside them as a consequence of living with the pandemic. I always remember one woman who said, the antiretrovirals helped me with my body, but you're helping with my soul, uh, dealing with stigma and rejection uh, and the stories that lie. And, and also, we often talk about multiple woundedness. So often many of the people who, have su who are suffering because of the pandemic are the same people, not always, but often the same people who suffered under political violence or under domestic violence. And so we needed to create the spaces where even when it was aimed at people infected, affected by HIV and AIDS, they could speak about the other wounds that they were also carrying. In almost every town in America, there are now wounded warriors, some missing limbs, and others carrying invisible wounds and post-traumatic stress disorder. What do you say to them, and how do the rest of us best support them? Can I first say that I'm delighted that people get PTSD. Um, wouldn't it be terrible if human beings could kill each other and be unaffected? The fact that we are damaged when we kill each other is a sign of our humanness. The ones you should worry about are the ones who can kill and are unaffected. And the way, I mean, we've just recently invented this word PTSD, but there were many other words in previous wars because human beings who go to war have always been damaged. And you see, if, if, if the war was a popular war, then you march down the street and there are military parades and everybody cheers. If it's an unpopular war, then you must just disappear. But you see, in neither case do we want to hear about what 
the warrior has come back with, about the, the, the trauma, um, the nightmares that they still live with. I think there's, I think we have to make a distinction between the, the needs of the veteran and what we do about war. And you see, neither side of politics in the United States is interested in ending war. The military industrial complex is fundamental to the present economy of the United States. It's a huge investment uh, in war. And so you, you, you need within the society the same kind of peace movement that ended the war in Vietnam. Uh, because as you say, in every village and hamlet across the United States, there are people who, who are crying outside or inside because of how war has affected them. When will the people of the United States wake up and say it's enough, it's enough? Um, but even while we want one cause for that, action against war, we have to, uh, I think the first thing is to say we have to be open to hear the pain of those who have gone to war. We have to find the ways of creating the safe and sacred spaces uh, for those who have been damaged by war. Um, and, 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 and those damaged by war those are, are need to respond to their needs should be regardless of how we feel about the injustice or the justice of that particular war. So we can be divided politically on our attitudes towards war and still say, but we're committed to the well-being of the veterans, those who have, in our name, uh, made terrible sacrifices uh, with their lives, but also, uh, and it kind of is an irony that the nature of modern medicine is that many people who in previous wars would have died, they now survive, but they survive often with the most terrible, terrible wounds. Those with the head wounds and, and, and permanent psychological, psychiatric, uh, physical uh, wounds. And, and in a way, one needs a national conversation to say, how are we going to deal with that? I would hope that that national conversation would feed into the opposition to war. But our opposition to war shouldn't be opposition to the needs of the veterans. In my experience, all human beings have within us a degree of woundedness. Um, and, and, and it comes both from our individual journeys, it comes from the journeys that our families, our parents, our grandparents have traveled. It comes from the journeys that our nations uh, have traveled. Uh, you know, uh, in, in the Christian tradition, we have Jesus saying, I didn't come for the healthy, I came for the sick. So I think that, and, and what that says to me is that whenever people are able to recognize their woundedness, there's a possibility for healing. When you say you've got all the answers and you're fine, well, there's nothing, nothing to be done. There's nothing that, 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 that can be done. I think where, where there has been particular war, oppression, massive injustice, then obviously the wounds will be much deeper than societies that have lived in peace for a long time. So, for example, I, I, I've just been in the Balkans uh, and somebody there said to me, there's a cycle where we go to war every 50 years. So, there are generations of wounds that go back, that continue. There are places in the world where, where people are still infected by wounds of things that happened 500 years, a thousand years ago. What I've learned that, that often a key first step, whether an individual, the community, or the nation towards healing, comes in the acknowledgement of the wrong that has been done. So, in the United States, will the United States ever truly heal without a full acknowledgement of slavery, a full acknowledgement of, of what happened to uh, indigenous people? Because in the acknowledgement, there begins to be the possibility of new journeys towards healing. And it's as equally true in our intimate relationships as it is true uh, in nations and between nations. You have helped um, found and steer the International Network for Peace, which is a group of terror victims around the world committed to peacemaking. 
tell us about some of the people and organizations that are involved and what have you learned from partnering with other groups and movements and will the same approach work in every conflict? The people who were the movers and shakers for that organization were September 11 Families for Peaceful Tomorrows. A small organization of people who were all lost family members and the events of September the 11th, but who said to the United States government, you may not go to war in the name of our loved ones, um, who have responded to violence and terror by seeking journeys of peace, healing, and reconciliation. So they were the inspiration to create this international network for peace. Um, another organization that's part of it is the Parent Circle uh, in Israel-Palestine, of parents of both Palestinians and Israelis. Again, who, in their grief, united by their pain, seek peaceful, non-violent uh, means of reconciliation and seeking for justice. So I think we, 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 we all bear witness to breaking this, the cycle of violence and conflict by, by, by taking our pain and our grief and using that energy uh, to look at the root causes of conflict be fearless in speaking for justice, but also live lives of commitment to reconciliation. And as wars and conflict dehumanize the other, of rehumanizing the other, and helping us see the humanity of those that we may be uh, in conflict with.